My name's David, and this is The Big Shut-In. It's Tuesday, June the 23rd, day 101 of social isolation. And it's an interesting moment because some things around the country and here in New York are starting to open up. There's some cracks in the in the armor of quarantine. Some people, and I'm probably among them, think it's happening way too fast and and that's going to hasten a second wave of coronavirus. Other people think it's happening too slowly and we should just throw the gates open and come what may. But in this moment, some people are actually doing some of the moving around that all of us used to do. I talked to my friend Michael, who's a photographer here in New York, and he's been doing something that I haven't done in so long that it seems downright weird, and that's travel for work. He's been moving around the country to close out a a contract that he had started before the quarantine began. And what he's found in airports and hotels and in the sort of shifting sands of people's responses to coronavirus and in the complex web of guidelines and restrictions was really interesting to hear about, particularly of my vantage point of being stuck in place. And so I'll keep this intro short and move right in to my conversation with Michael. Where are you right now? Describe to me. Uh, describe to me exactly where you where you're sitting as as we're I talking. am sitting at a desk in a Holiday Inn, just across the river from downtown Hartford. So you are in. I just this is this is entering the realm of of uh, fantasy for me right now. Like you might as well be describing science fiction. <laughs> you are in a a hotel in a room of a hotel, in a city in which you do not live, to which you yes. traveled. That's correct. And this is the the uh, third hotel in the third city that I've traveled to in the last four weeks. So, she's a flip. So, why, tell me more. Tell me the story. Why are you gallivanting around the country when most of us are trapped in our houses? Well, I was trapped in my house until the first week of June. Um, But before I was trapped, I had a project. Like many of us, I, you know, I had work that I was doing. I'm a photographer. I do corporate work, uh, primarily portraiture uh, for law firms and other professional services firms. Um, And I sold a fairly large project for my business. And after three days out of 14 days of this project, everything got shut down. And so as, as states have started to reopen, we've started to kind of ramp back up into the project. Uh, so that's what I've been traveling for is, is for a project that the client would like to get done. And so I just, I'm so fascinated by every every aspect of this. I want to talk through every quotidian aspect of this experience for you, because honestly, like I'm still a little nervous about going to the grocery store, (laughs) like let alone the airport. So like, tell me who made the decision that it was time to, to ramp this up again. The client did that. They reach out to you and say, okay, we, we feel good. How do you feel? How did that go? How did that conversation go? Uh, how did that conversation go? I don't even remember exactly. Um, when we first shut down and we first put the project on hold, um, we'd had everything scheduled, um, for the end of March and the beginning of April. We were supposed to be wrapped up and done shooting by, by tax day, essentially. Um, And so once the shutdown happened, it wasn't clear how long that was going to be. 
So we rescheduled for sort of tentatively late April. And then when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, we rescheduled again for May, uh, but only for two offices out of uh, 11 offices, I think it is. Initially, that original reschedule, we got, got pushed back again because people couldn't get haircuts. Like that was, <laughs> um, that was the main concern. <laughs> Not because they, you know, afraid of catching the disease or anything, but they don't, they want to look good for the shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the question was who, who made the decision? It was sort of like a, a back and forth. Everybody wanted to get this project finished. And so I, initially, I don't know that either they or I were pushing it. We were both just sort of like, you know, when can we do this? Um, and I sort of, uh, from my end, I was like, if your offices are going to be open and you feel safe having me into your office, I will feel comfortable going in assuming that we're following, you know, all the guidelines that are out there. And what, what's happened since is, you know, I think, I mean, you're, you're making these decisions with all this imperfect information. Like you don't have a full sense of what's happening. And I think that's exacerbated because people, people who will remain unnamed, I, I think there's large numbers of people who don't want to see what's happening uh, or for other people to see exactly what's happening. So these two, the first two offices that we could shoot were in Florida and Colorado. And so for me, it was like, well, let's get these done because they're the smaller offices. They're kind of easy to get to. The biggest risk for these seemed at the time that we dis- when we scheduled them, that it would be the flight. I didn't feel uncomfortable going to an office to meet two attorneys to photograph them. I'd be there for an hour. Like that didn't seem like a a high risk situation to me. You know, everyone's going to be in, you know, at a distance. I'm only in, you know, I'm not even within six feet of people. Well, right. I mean, it doesn't seem like a high risk situation for you, but it seems like the risk for them is you coming from New York where, you know, the hotbed, the, the epicenter of this to someplace like Colorado where it maybe hadn't really taken hold yet. Like well, so that's the, the interesting flip is I go to Florida and, at, you know, when I went to Florida, they were still urging people to self isolate and quarantine for two weeks on coming in from the New York metro area because they saw us as the risk. Right. But by the time I went, it was the opposite. All of our numbers were dropping. And after I left a day or two after I left, like their numbers were starting to creep up. And look, not my fault. I mean, <laughs> this is a, uh, but you know, I think that other places are like, oh, New York is scary, but I go down there and I'm like washing my hands and, you know, hand sanitizer every five minutes. I've got a mask on anytime I leave the hotel room and no one else is wearing a mask. Do you know what I mean? Not nobody, but, um, very few people out on the street, you know, people were sitting in restaurants So they're looking at like, oh, this isn't a problem for us. You're the problem coming in when clearly that wasn't the case. Like I felt like I was taking it much more seriously than the people there. Um, And obviously part of it is like, I don't want to, I don't want to incur any liability for, you know, God forbid I get someone else sick. I don't want to do that at all. So I'm doing all I can not to get anyone else sick and to do everything that I can to keep it as safe as possible. What are the what are the precautions you're taking um, on the shoot? Uh, I mean, I, it's not like my these shoots are high contact kind of things, and they're not extended interactions. So I'm making sure that you know. I, I, first off, I'm wearing a mask the whole time. Uh, we are distanced six feet plus, with the exception of a couple of. 30 second or minute long things where we're like looking at a screen together. And again, we're three or four feet apart, you know, keeping as much distance. Um, But it's primarily the distancing, wearing masks, and then making sure that there's no physical contact and that I am, um, you know, hand washing, hand sanitizing, and then keeping all the equipment sanitized. I mean, are they asking you for a, a, a one sheet that talks about your protocols or something like that? Or are they not, you know? Are they sending uh, that to you to tell you what it is? They did not ask me. We had a conversation about it and just kind of kept it very 
high level. Um, again, they had, I had already done three days of this project, so they saw how I was working and it was already a very minimal production. It was already fairly socially distanced because it was just before the shutdown started. It was when we were all like not shaking hands anymore, but bumping elbows as though that was going to solve this problem. I remember the, that was so quaint. That, w- that was, uh, that was yeah. like end of February, right? Kind of. It was that yeah, period. Yeah. Yeah. First week of March, I think was that when that, when we were doing it. And, uh, I mean, it was like people would come in and forget that they couldn't shake my hand and they would come in and shake my hand. So they'd shake my hand. And then before the next person came, I'd have to go wash my hands again. Like I washed my hands like 30 times that day. But so, th- so th- the point was that they had seen sort of what, how I'd been operating. And so when I just basically said, look, we're going to add in masks, we're going to add in additional sanit- you know, hand sanitizing and, you know, we'll reduce touch further. They, they were okay with sort of that level of detail. Um, and they were developing their own policies for the office, but I think everyone is figuring it out. And I think also given that I was going to different offices in different States, the perception of what was necessary, uh, and how big a a risk or how big a, a threat this is varied. Well, that was my next question. Actually, what was, was there a marked difference between the shoot in Florida and the shoot in Colorado. And did you do the one in Connecticut yet or is, is it tomorrow? It was today. So I, today, today, tomorrow. Yes. Uh, no, I'm in Connecticut now. Yeah. I shot one day today. We're shooting another day tomorrow. So, um, so add that in too, were the three, how were the three of them different from each other? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that the in office shoots are particularly difficult, uh, different. What was different was the vibe in the hotel or the access to restaurants you know, outside of the offices, outside of the shooting hours. Uh, that's what's been most different. We, oh, well, let's let's get into that. Let's talk about what traveling is like right now. So tell me about, tell me, I want to hear about flying. I want to hear about hotels. I want to hear about restaurant, like eating. Um, mm-hmm. But both because I'm curious what the experience is like and also because I'm living vicariously through you at the moment. <laughs> and this is a bit like pornography for me where it's like I get to, you, you get to go to a different building and sleep there and eat different food that you didn't make yourself. And like, it's fantastic. Like I want to hear all about it. Speak slowly yeah, the, and, and uh, use lots of descriptors, please. Lots of, <laughs> um, so flying. So I've been taking, uh, photographs of the departure boards at each airport I've been to. Uh, there aren't very many flights, which is the first part about flying is that it's hard to get anywhere because there are so few flights. So when I flew back into JFK from Florida, the departure board in Terminal 4, which is Delta's terminal, uh, had five flights outbound that day. Really? Yeah. As opposed to, I mean, 100 or something, right? On a yeah. normal day? Yeah. Like, and that's so, I mean, that was super insane. Um, it was also super insane on that flight that, like, the Tampa airport was busier than JFK. There were five flights that day, and one of them was to Tampa? Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of amazing. <laughs> I guess maybe it was the only one that week or something. I don't, I don't know, but that's amazing. Yeah, I think they, they had one flight back and forth from Tampa each day, I think. It was funny, though, when we had scheduled in May, and I was supposed to fly from New York to Denver, Denver to Tampa, Tampa back to New York. Uh, it was impossible to fly from Denver to Tampa, even with connections. Even if I wanted to fly first class, there were no flights into Tampa coming out of um, Denver. So I was going to have to fly to Fort Lauderdale and drive. You couldn't even connect from Chicago or something or Atlanta? Like, that's bizarre. Because there would be like, because there were only like, again, three or four flights probably into Tampa and they were full. Wow. And I was also, when we rescheduled that, I was booking like two weeks out. So it was also playing it a little close on time, which ordinarily would be fine. You'd just have to, you know, have a connection you didn't like or something, but. Or it would be expensive. Or it would be expensive. Um, And and the flights haven't been expensive. Uh, But so that's the first thing is that the airports, you know, are quite quiet. Uh, The exception to that was Atlanta. Atlanta actually felt busy, even though it only had, I don't know, 15 or 20 flights going out the day I went through on its departure board. Did people tend to be masked and 
distancing from each other in in airports or were people kind of going about their business as if business were normal uh it depends on the airport in jfk people were generally masked in tampa i'd say it was most people were masked that was the first week of june on the flight back from tampa um one person on my plane wasn't wearing a mask or at least one person near me uh which i was very uncomfortable with and i you know sent a note to the airline about uh and before my flight to Denver, all the airlines made a big show of saying that we're going to start enforcing this more uh, aggressively, which they did to a degree, but but not fully. You know, like I think United banning that one passenger and making a big show of it. I wonder if there wasn't a degree of theater to that that wasn't backed up on all of their flights. Uh, because again, on my flight from Minneapolis to... Uh, JFK, there were half a dozen people on, on that flight who weren't wearing masks. And at the end of the flight, I, I said to the, the flight attendant, I said, you, they, you know, cause you, you're leaving and they very, you know, they asked you that rhetorical question. Oh, hope you had a nice flight. How was your flight? Blah, blah, blah. And I just leaned over and I said, not too close. I leaned over a little bit, uh, and said, you know, I just would have been more comfortable if you had enforced the mask guidelines. There were uh, several people not wearing masks on the flight. And her response was, oh, I, I didn't see them. Which, I mean, it's apparent to me, and I'm sitting three rows away from someone. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're walking up and down the aisle two or three times an hour. Like, that's not a great excuse. I mean, I, I, I should ask, I, I should have prefaced this, I guess, by asking sort of where you're at um, with the COVID verse generally. Like, are you feeling nervous about, like, sort of where's your, where's your fear level at generally? about all of this? Uh, well, when New York shut down, my wife and I didn't leave the apartment for days on end. Um, we would go out grocery shopping once a week, and that was kind of it for four or five weeks, I guess. As the numbers in New York have dropped, we've gotten a little less strict, but we've still generally been inside four or five days a week uh, out once, maybe twice to go to the grocery store. We're still very cautious. Um, and while traveling, I've still been very cautious. I'm, I go outside, I'm wearing a mask. When you're in the airport, what do you do about things like eating, going to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, basic things you do in an airport. Well, I mean, I still use the bathroom and then I would wash my hands, but that was sort of always the procedure on that. Well, I would hope so, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly. Um, like I'm not taking my mask off in the bathroom. I don't, um, in terms of eating, I would, because there were so few flights going out, there were a lot of empty gates. And so I would, I, I grabbed like a pre-made sandwich and I would just go to like an empty gate and stay as far away from people as I could take the mask off, eat, have some water and then put the mask back on. Um, but I didn't take the mask off when I was near people. Um, I mean, and I wasn't the craziest person there. There was a, a couple in like um, uh, Tyvek lab coats and they had a mask and they had, you know, glasses and then a face shield over that. I wasn't, I mean, that wasn't me. Um, but I also wasn't the people who were not wearing masks and clearly looking for someone to tell them that they had to put the some sort of shackle on their face or something like um, there are people that were like looking to be challenged. I mean, like I've just kind of come to accept that I have to wear a mask and it doesn't seem to me crazy. Like somebody, somebody in Colorado that I was chatting with mentioned that their husband was saying that they hope this isn't the new normal. Um, and that they just don't like wearing masks all the time. And I, I mentioned, uh, so my, my wife's Korean and we go visit her, her, uh, mother frequently you know, it doesn't seem that crazy to have to put masks on that we go to Korea and we see people who are regularly wearing masks if they don't feel well or if they've got a cold or a sniffle or something that they, they wear masks. And it's sort of a, you know, just expected that if you're not feeling well, you're going to put a mask on to protect other people. I think for me, recognizing that I'm not doing this necessarily to protect myself, but to protect other people makes it feel like a much more uh, doable kind of thing. Um. So I'm curious about all the other sort of elements of getting around. 
tell me about hotels and what those have been mm-hmm. like and also also sort of ground transportation like getting getting from place to place kind of thing yeah so in tampa i took a taxi from the hotel to the airport i opened the window and kept my head halfway out the window because i don't I, you know well, it's you know it's actually i think that's that's probably a good idea because i've heard that the uh, infection rate among labrador retrievers is very low so <laughs> Um, so, so Tampa, I took, I took a taxi both to and from the the airport in Denver. Uh, I have a a student who lives in Denver. Um, so I, I teach an adjunct class at a a school in, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, and you know, I, I felt a little bit guilty at, at having to switch the class from an in-person to a, uh, online model. Like, I, I don't know that my students got exactly what I had hoped they would get from the semester. Um, they all did great. And I, I gave the best that I could give. Um, but one of the students from that class happened to live in Denver. Uh, so I actually hired her to drive me to and from the airport uh, and to the client site because I figured it was less expensive than renting a car. And then she also got to sort of observe the shoot from a distance. Uh, Safer than a taxi, I would think. Less less people have been in and out of that car. That's that was my feeling, um, and part of it also was like, if I'm going to pay someone, I would rather, you know, like I like I knew that she hadn't been working through this period, and it felt like a, a nice gesture, also. Um, so that was that was how I got around. Um, the hotel in Tampa was, a, I think, eleven percent occupancy. It was mostly empty. Uh, the staff there for the most part were wearing masks, but not always fully or properly. And then in, in Denver, I feel like the, I'm trying to remember exactly what the, the occupancy rate was. It was the highest that it had been since the lockdown and it was 20 or 25% somewhere in there. Um, so also fairly empty. Neither of the hotels had their restaurants open. Both had a coffee shop that was open for limited hours in the morning. And when I was in Denver, their bar was open for happy hour in the evening. Uh, so no, no room service available. No room to. service, which was something that was challenging in Florida because, you know, in theory, I should have been self-isolating in the hotel and not leaving, but it wasn't possible to eat in the hotel or to have, uh, none of the area restaurants were delivering. So like I, you know, if I was going to eat, I was going to have to go out you know, to get takeout. So it's hard to follow some of the government guidelines in actual practice, which was, you know, something that was interesting. That was like, well, this is what we're doing to protect people, but you can't actually follow these to the letter because it's just, that's not the situation on the ground. So the the guideline at the time when you first went to Florida, if I'm not wrong, would have been that you should have completely self-isolated for two weeks, right? Yes. In your room. But what you're saying is that actually unless you had brought two weeks of food with you, would not have been possible. Uh, yeah, essentially. Um, I overheard a conversation from someone, I think on the plane flying back from Tampa, who said, yeah, I was totally quarantined uh, for two weeks. I only went out, you know, from at like 6 a.m. to go to the grocery store. And I just thought that's, that's not quarantining at all. So I think even people who think that they're fully quarantining aren't. Um, you know, but... You know, I did my best to, I only left the hotel to pick up, take out, uh, and for this one hour that I was in the client office. I mean, I can't help but think that, I've been thinking this a lot as I'm, I'm looking around just here in my neighborhood. Um, you mentioned ineffective mask usage, which has become a real pet peeve of mine, you know, where you, you see people who have it just over their mouth and not over their nose, you know, or something like that, or they've taken just it down covering their chin, yeah, smoke a cigarette or something. And it's, and I just, and, and I, part of me, because I'm, I'm kind of a confrontational person to begin with, um, part of me just wants to go up to people and say, you know, like, don't, what is them, like, why are you even bothering to put a mask on? What, what do you think you're like? Don't you understand how breathing works? Like, what? <laughs> yeah. But part of it too, and I think what you're saying too is, I think, you know, there's been such a distressing lack of central leadership in all of this, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, the White House is, has been fluctuating madly between, you know, we're putting a task force together to this is all a hoax, don't worry about it, you know. And so yeah. I think sometimes I just feel like 
there's people who just really don't know that they need to cover their nose because <laughs> nobody told them, you know, or like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what, but yeah. Or it becomes a badge of protest. I mean, yeah. In a really wrong headed way. Yeah. I mean, it's Colorado was interesting. Um, so when I, I actually, when I went, I felt very comfortable going to Colorado because their numbers are dropping. They're like New York. They're very, um, they've, they've essentially contained the situation. Um, though since I've left again through no fault of my own, um, they've gone from declining numbers to what look like flat numbers. So it's, um, this is a disturbing trend, Michael. I, yeah, it's not good. Um, but again, not related to me. No, this is what I'm telling I've been you. hiding in a hotel. That's a disturbing trend. You're but I'm hiding of, in a hotel. You're a bit of a harbinger is what we're learning. <laughs> you know what? I think, I think, I think it uh. isn't, it's not me so much, but I think these states are reopening. And this is what I was going to say about, about what I was noticing in Colorado is, um, again, in Colorado, the hotel didn't have a restaurant, so I had to go pick up food. And I, I went to pick up food uh, from one restaurant and I had delivery a, a second night. Uh, but I, when I went to pick up food, you know, people were eating inside. People were, you know, relatively close together uh, in their, you know, even in the outdoor seating or having conversations while they waited for a table to become available. So I think as these states have reopened, it's inevitable that there's going to be that the numbers are going to go back up. And I think we're probably going to see that in, you know, in Connecticut, in New York, in New Jersey, as, as you know, as our, as we start reopening, we're going to see it also, uh, because then there's inevitably going to be more contact. There's inevitably going to be people who just forget and don't wear, don't put the mask on or, uh, forget and they get too close. Uh, this morning, you know, one of the office, uh, not from the client, but someone in the building, you know, welcomed us into the space and went to shake, you know, the client contacts hand. And she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, I think people just forget. So I think as we loosen the restrictions and as we start increasing the contact that we have, it's inevitable that this is going to go up. The harbinger isn't that I've gone to a state. It's that a state has reopened to a degree that I am allowed to go to that state and to do what I do. Um, I think that's the harbinger. So you just keep asking see- that buck, Michael, but you know, we know the truth. <laughs> that's right. I'm, I've got a spritzer bottle of COVID. <laughs> You're the new typhoid, typhoid Mary for the, the 21st century. That's right. No, I'm, 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 I, of course, I don't think that. But um, yeah. a spritzer bottle. There you go. There's a statement. Um, the, uh, it's chemtrails all over again, David. <laughs> People are talking about that too. Anyway, so yep. chemtrails. Um, oh, God. Um, so w- w- tell me about the rest of your itinerary. You're in Connecticut now for another day or two. Another then- day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm here for another day and we're shooting the second day at the office. This is the other thing about this project that's been interesting, um, is that we had designed this schedule to be very tight, but in rescheduling it, uh, all of these offices are only allowed to operate at 50% capacity. So every one day projects become a two day project. Which so tomorrow I'm going to do the second half of, of the, the the office here, and then I'm uh, driving to Boston to shoot one person in the morning, and then to Warwick, Rhode Island, to shoot a couple of people in their office there, uh, and then back to New York in the evening. And then I still have half of it left. We have uh, some uh, an office in New York, a couple offices in New Jersey, uh, and an office in Philadelphia. So there's another. 10 ish days that we have to find a way to do. Wow. Um, but you know, the, the worry for me is, you know, Cuomo hinted at this last week, you know, that it, if numbers go up, we're going to shut down again. And I feel like he's setting the expectation that that's going to happen because he's seeing what's happening in other States. Uh, and I think he's more willing and has enough political capital to shut us down again so I'm hoping to get this project finished before the Metro New York region sees any spikes in cases again and has to shut down again. Because I, I feel like, I, I just have a feeling that that's going to be likely. I think a lot of us are thinking that, you know, and um, are you booking then other other work? Is there more of these? 
Um, are people uh, is the phone ringing? Are you answering it? Uh, I have bid on some projects, but I've bid on them not expecting them to happen soon. Um, I have a couple of regular clients who I know have postponed projects, um, small projects. I was hoping that I could do a couple of projects in July and maybe August. At this point, I'd be happy to simply get this one project finished. Um, if only so that when we shut down, I don't have to keep thinking about it. You know, the anxiety of not having work is one thing, but having a project hanging over you uncompleted and also being worried about future work is, um, it, it's almost too much. I'd like to get this, this out of the way. That's sort of been my focus, but it's, you know, it's a, if projects came up, I don't know that I would say no to them. Uh, but I, the logistical challenges to make these projects, to make large projects happen is, is high. Uh, how does your wife feel about this trip, these trips, this traveling that you're doing? Uh, that's, it, it was funny just before this, uh, but just before our call, my wife and I were chatting. She was like, I want to go somewhere. Um, <laughs> like she's feeling very <laughs> frustrated about being, uh, cooped up. I can um, relate. Yeah. I mean, and I think she sees it. She's like, well, you know, so for, she's like, oh, well, you're getting to go somewhere. Yeah. Except when I'm traveling, I'm terrified. And when I'm not traveling or doing like the three or four hours a day in this office, I'm cowering in a hotel room. Um, you know, it used to be you'd go on a, a project. So I did a, so a year ago I was in Detroit doing a project for LVMH. We were doing a, a series of portraits uh, at a, uh, a conference of some sort. And, you know, it was exciting to go to Detroit. I got to go check out kind of a cool restaurant the night before the project. I had the morning free, so I got to go to um, John T. King's, one of the, my favorite bookstores in the world. It used to be fun to travel for work. I mean, I, I love I it. Would rather I've always liked it. I was in L.A. in January, you know, and staying in a nice hotel and eating fun things and seeing friends and yeah. meeting people. I, I, I adore traveling for work usually um yeah it doesn't seem fun right now um i mean other people seem to be enjoying it more and i feel like i don't want to be that person like i'm still extremely cautious um so i think i think my wife thinks that i'm out like on a holiday whereas like i'm just trying to find any restaurant that's open that doesn't look terrible you know um and then i'm bringing it home to eat at the hotel. So let me, let me ask mm. you one, one more question and, and uh, feel free to tell me it's none of my business, um, at least on the record, but um, how you doing business wise and how long, you know, if, if things are to shut down again, if you're not to book another big project because, you know, we're forced to roll back to stage mm -hmm. zero again, how's, how long can your, can you do that for? business wise like how, how are you how are you doing with all this yeah um i'm not thrilled if i can get this project finished and build i'll be fine into the fall uh i mean i won't be happy you know the q1 looked like it was going to be really good several fairly large things seem like they might be on the table for q2 or into q3 um so i thought 2020 was going to be a really good year if nothing else happens it's going to be kind of a a bad year, but not dismal. Um, and because my wife has a full-time job and because she's working remotely from home, that takes some pressure off. I mean, that's the, I also haven't done my, like I've been putting off bookkeeping for two months because I just don't want to know kind of <laughs> 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 like, I just don't want to confront it in that, a way. Like th there's a certain parallel with that, with the, uh, the testing, um, the new testing protocols that the, the president is suggesting that if, uh, <laughs> if we don't test, we won't know, oh, you know, yeah. the, the disease won't be there. Yeah. You know? So if right. you don't, well, if you don't do your books, then you have all the money. It's Schrodinger's, it's Schrodinger's bank account, right? It could yeah. be. Um, no, I mean, I'm keeping an eye on the bank account. I know how much is there, how much the general monthly expenses are. I just don't want to see the details of it. I've been avoiding the details of it. But it's not like I'm at a point where I'm like, I need to start cutting 
this or I need to start cutting that. It's not quite there yet. The overhead is is manageable. Um, and that's one thing with my business that I've I've always tried to keep it extremely uh, minimal in terms of overhead, just knowing that, uh, you know, businesses like ours can go from looking amazing to being nothing over the course of a month. Yeah, so, for sure, for sure. Uh, so, you know, with that feast and famine kind of cycle in mind, I, I felt like, I've always felt like keeping the overhead low is the best bet, which um, seems to be the right call now. I, th- I think I'm finding that talking to a lot of, you know, freelancers slash entrep- creative entrepreneur types, such as we, that, you know, we're, we all might be having to tap dance a little faster, a little harder than usual, but, we, you know, we keep our shoes polished anyway, because mm-hmm. there's always bad months, bad quarters in between the good right. ones. Um, um, uh, but be safe out there, all right? Take care of thank yourself. Thank you. And be careful. That's the goal. Uh, I'm looking forward to get, it's funny, my wife is concerned that she ha- wants to get out and I can, I just want to get home, uh, which is funny. My name is David Hoffman and this is The Big Shut In. I produce the show. It's a production of Race Car Radio, racecarradio.com. If you have feedback for me or you have a story that you think I should hear, please feel free to reach out the big shut in at racecarradio.com racecarradio is a division of citizen racecar applied imagination <laughs>